And we are ready for next mystery. And I think we have a soundtrack just announcing to us our next puzzling mystery of the universe. an anti-man in the audience. Can I call my anti-man on stage? Mike Dozer. E is equal <laughs> mc square, the equation. In 1932, experiment. It followed from the special theory of relativity. By the way, this is Einstein's real voice, saying E equal mc square. Good evening, Antiman. This Hi is there. Mike Dozer from uh, the Antimatter Experimental Program of CERN. Mike, can I touch you? Yeah, you sure. No danger. I'm not really an anti-man. Okay. What, what would happen if you were really an anti-man? You wouldn't be around to touch me anymore. Everything would have gone up in here. Big explosion. Because this is one of the most uh, fundamental features of antimatter. Is that right? That's right. When antimatter meets matter, they transform into energy completely and it's the most efficient transformation of production of energy that you can get. So antimatter really exists? Oh yes, definitely. It's yeah. not like time travel? Not at all. Antimatter has been known to exist since uh, 1932, experimentally, and 1928, um, theoretically. I see, so that was long ago. That's quite a while, yeah. And you are not that old, but you've been working on antimatter, and you're still working on it here That's at right. CERN. I've been working uh, with anti-atoms, anti-particles, anti-protons uh, for about 20 years now. Okay, and uh, how do you do? How do you do that? Uh, how do you create antimatter? How do you study it? Well, you use the equation that's that's written over there, E equal m c squared. You transform kinetic energy, the movement of particles, you accelerate particles in an accelerator. You give them a lot of energy. You smash them against something heavy, and they transform their kinetic energy into potential energy which transforms itself into particles and antiparticles. And antiparticles, can they be found in nature? Yeah, sure. That's exactly how the first antiparticles were found uh, in 1932. The first antiparticle was an anti-electron that came from space. Actually, uh, from our atmosphere, not really from space. And that was quite long ago? Yes. The positron, was The positron, right? exactly. Uh, but CERN has also made a milestone in the study and research of antimatter. What did we do? <laughs> <laughs> different things, many, many different things. But I think what you're alluding to is the production of atoms, anti-atoms, uh, which were produced about 10 years ago for the first time in um, a similar experiment like this one, where you again transform a lot of energy. We are seeing the video. That's it, yes, basically. Well, you're seeing me right now. Um, <laughs> it's coming back. Can we see the video? Yes, thank you. Yeah. So this, I guess, explains more or less how you produce antimatter. You accelerate protons, hit a target, and then in that target you produce many, many different particles, some of which are antiparticles, antiprotons. And if you are clever then, you can catch them in another accelerator, slow them down, and pass them on to one of several experiments that will then combine them with anti-electrons and... Um, produce anti-hydrogen atoms. So that's what uh, 
uh, we did a CERN in uh, the Lear In the Lear Accelerator in 1995, and more recently in the AD, a couple of years ago, two, three years ago, but in much, much larger quantities, and especially much, much colder. The first antihydrogen that was produced was moving almost at the speed of light, whereas the antihydrogen that we produce now has temperatures of um, a few hundred degrees only. So if you take the table of elements with uh, the hundred and I don't know how many elements there are from hydrogen, the simplest to uranium and the most complex one, we can say that at CERN we just opened up a new table of anti-elements and we put the first anti-elements there, the anti-hydrogen. That's right, the first anti-hydrogen. The second one will be much, much more difficult to make because we're cheating a little bit. We don't actually make the atom completely. We produce the, the nucleus, like there, the antiproton, in the accelerator. But if you want to make heavier elements, you also have to produce the anti-nucleus in the accelerator. And for every additional neutron or proton that you put in, you lose a factor of a million in efficiency. It's so a very difficult thing to do. It's producing. very difficult, yeah. Making a lot of heavier elements would be almost impossible. What is the main difficulty? You said that we would annihilate if you were made of antimatter. I am made of matter as I am, actually. Mm -hmm. What's the most difficult thing to do when you're assembling an anti-hydrogen atom? It's probably making the components, the individual components, the anti-protons and the, the positrons. You, you, you can make a few hundred, a few thousand, a few hundred thousand, but to make really macroscopic quantities, uh, say a gram of antimatter, would require much, much more energy than is available on Earth. Uh, and it would require something like several billion uh, CERNs running for several billion years. So what bombarding the Vatican with an anti-atom bomb is really far away from reality. It's very, very far removed from reality. CERN has made a millionth of the amount of matter, anti-matter needed to do that. Uh, and it billionth, a billionth even. And it took us a lot of effort to do and that. And it took a lot of effort, a lot of energy, a lot of money. The, the world is not rich enough to make as much antimatter as you would need to make even a single gram of antimatter. At the moment, you're working on a new antimatter experiment. That's right, yes. What is it called? Uh, it doesn't really have a name yet. We're, our working title is Aegis. The previous experiment was Athena, and this is the successor to Athena. OK, and uh, what is your purpose with this experiment? Well, there, there are two purposes. One of them is to compare the properties of matter and antimatter, and the other one is to see whether antimatter falls up or down. And that's much, much more exotic, the second possibility. But to compare the properties of matter and antimatter, there's a large scale of experiments that are working on this. We're trying to do it by looking really at the properties of protons and antiprotons, hydrogen, antihydrogen. But other experiments look at the properties of, say, B mesons, uh, kaons, and so on. Apart from the curiosity of understanding how antimatter behaves, if it's uh, sensitive to gravity like we are or not, why is it important to study antimatter? Uh, the question we're really trying to answer is to see what happened at the beginning of the universe. Uh, the, the, the equation that transforms energy into matter, as E equal mc squared over there, uh, basically says that every time you make some amount of matter out of energy, you make the same amount of antimatter. And if you look at the universe that's expanding 15 billion years ago, it must have been much, much smaller, much, much denser, a very dense form of energy. And once energy materialized, transformed itself into stuff, it should have made as much matter as antimatter. Uh, on the other hand, if you look out in the universe now, everything that you can see in the visible universe just shows that there is no antimatter whatsoever left. Everything is just matter. And we're trying to understand why this largest embarrassment to, to physics, uh, how this could have happened.